Hello, and welcome to the Dog Savant Podcast. My name is Brett Endes. I am a professional dog trainer, and the purpose for this podcast is to share my dog training experience with you if you are a dog owner who is in need of training advice, uh, if you're a client who would like to supplement the work we're doing in the real world, and if you're just anyone who would like to learn more about their dog, dog behavior, problem behavior solving, the life of a professional dog trainer, this podcast is for you. Uh, today is episode 87. Um, and we're going to talk about building a dog run or fenced in area uh, for your pet. Um, I'm in the middle of a project right now. We'll talk a bit about that. And uh, I figured I'd just give some tips and pointers that I've been learning along the way. And other times I've built fences and mistakes I've made uh, to maybe help you if you want to make a nice secure uh, area for your dog. Um, and I always ask, you know, if you've listened to this podcast before, please rate, review, share, subscribe. Uh, lately, I've been asking people to support me on Patreon. I put out more content through that. If you uh, do so, uh, it's patreon.com backslash the dog savant. Uh, follow me on social media. Send me a message, a question. You can uh, email me at info at the dog And uh, I also am doing online training. So if you're interested in virtual training, one on one sessions with me, uh, you can contact me as well through email uh, or on social media, and I would love to help you with your dog in any way I can. Um, okay, so building the fence. Um, I've been talking a lot about the property I have here in Colorado. Uh, we've got some space, so I've been doing some work here just to make it uh, improved and more dog friendly. I want to be able to have more space for both our dogs and clients' dogs who stay here. Uh, we did have a fence about a, around an acre of the property and some other sections, but they're more of a, it's called a buck and rail style fence where they're really attractive, they're nice, uh, they're good for horses and other types of uh, animals, but for dogs, they really don't do a thing. There's big gaps in it, it's an angled fence. Uh, they're not going to last too long because they're made out of logs, so they'll eventually, uh, eventually rot. So in part of the yard, I got rid of that. So that was step one. Um, and this is, I'll just kind of take you along my process and then maybe how it would help you. So first and foremost, if you're not just in like a traditional lot in suburbia, you know, you may have to clear uh, either old fencing or some space. In our case, I have some trees I also had to clear and roots. Uh, you want to have a nice, I even cleaned the, the yard out. You want to have a nice, clean canvas to start with. Um, I, I've learned if you do things step by step from the most basic step up to the most complicated, it usually works out with the least amount of mistakes. So get a nice clean working area, whether it be a small yard, you're building a little run on the side of your house. It's really the same thing. We're doing about an acre that's going to surround our house on part of our property, uh, but it could be much smaller. It would still follow the same principles. Um, so make sure you do that. Uh, then, of course, you want to mark your corners. You want to have a good idea of where your, your outline of your fence is actually going to be. You want it to be straight. Uh, you want to see if there's any imperfections in the land as far as not being level. Uh, we did all that. Um, then you want to mark your holes. Uh, people usually do, uh, from my research, again, I'm not a contractor, not an expert, but I just have enough experience with the whole dog fencing thing where I'll just share the research I've done and the little bit of work I've done in this area. Um, you usually they space them out eight feet. I think sometimes they'll do six feet. Uh, then you'll have gate spacing, so you'll have to have your holes at four feet. We have a couple four foot gates, then an eight foot gate, and then we have a 12 foot gate that we can get a car through. We have a lot of different entry areas just to have access. Um, so you want to mark all that. Then you're drilling. Some people, if it's a small space and they have soft soil, uh, you know, they'll just use like a post hole digger or a, or a one or two man auger. Uh, I myself, we're, we're in the Rocky Mountains and you cannot predict what's going to be soil and what's going to be just solid rock. So I hired a guy who uh, has um, the machine, you know, with the attachments that just have the auger bit on it and the rock breaker. Uh, and fortunately, most dug down to where we need it to be. Um, some people will tell you to dig down because, well, how deep are the holes? They'll say to dig down a third of the height. So we're going to do a six-foot fence. Uh, so we have eight-foot poles. We're trying to get at least two feet. Um, and in some areas, we hit that. Other areas, we had to break some rock and get down as best we could. I'm just going to reinforce some of the spots with cement. Um, now, some people say, well, you have to use cement on all your holes. For us, you know, in the future, we may have to replace poles as they rot. I also just, it's just such a, a, an ordeal here to, to get the holes in the first place. It's just going to be so time consuming. Expense is also a thing. So what I've learned in my research is that you can, as you are, as long as you get a third of the post height, 
you can pack down the soil. I mean, we're talking every two or four inches. I was in there with a, you know, either have they have a tamper tool or what I'm using is a two by six and a two by four based on the, you know, and just really packing it down, putting some rocks to wedge it, really working it. Uh, so that's how we're supporting our pole, really taking time. I mean, I today, I'm exhausted. I got six poles in. I'm gonna do the, uh, the ones I can do in the soil first, then I'm gonna come back around and then do the ones I have to cement. Um, so when you cement poles, right, because some people just do cement around all their posts uh, for extra reinforcement, they would uh, use the quick crete, the, the quick drying cement, or they'll mix it. And then what you do is you just put the post in the hole, whatever depth you, you're, you're going to be doing. Uh, you want to level it. That's another thing is you have to, if you don't have two people, you're going to have to make a brace to level all of your poles once you're setting them. Uh, so the setting is important as well. I think the hardest part is digging the holes. It just takes the most labor that's why i just hired out for that uh setting the poles isn't the most uh it's not easy it's not that you know it takes a lot of uh, hard work but it, it can be done you know you see the progress so it keeps you motivated to keep going but you know again coming back with the concrete is going to be a different way of doing it where you put the poles and you set put the concrete and let it set while you have it leveled um braced up for that um and then you just kind of come back and just make sure everything's good to go. There's controversy, and I'm not sure how I'm going to do it. Some people, what they'll do is they'll do enough concrete up to the top of the hole and then have kind of a conical shape where it meets your post so that the water will run away from the post, not down into it, which makes a lot of sense. Um, you really rot is a big thing that I'm finding here when you're doing fence building with these posts. Uh, some people say it's not a big deal to do just the bottom portion just to support in an anchor your post and then you could backfill it with your soil. I'm not sure yet. I'm doing this one step at a time. That's why I'm just right now doing the ones I can fully backfill where I got the holes deep enough uh, to be able to do it without cement. Um, then we're going to have that. And I'm thinking maybe 75% I could do without cement and the rest. I'm going to just reinforce gate posts, corner posts just with cement, even if I do can get deep enough. Um, just to give that extra reinforcement. So that's my next step. And depending, if you're using doing something like here, we're doing like a big ranch wire kind of fence where we have a big space we're trying to cover and animals that could be knocking up against it. We're gonna also do, it's called an H brace, right? And this is where you see a lot of these farm fences where it looks like a the letter H or kind of like a pole that goes across. Usually you'll see them in the corners and it, where gates are. And that's something where you have to take wire. And I'll probably do a little video showing me do it. I haven't gotten to that step yet, but what you do on that is you go and take your wire and it's gonna cross over and you see them have these like cranks or a lot of people will twist it with rebar and it puts tension on the post across the top instead, or like it, it kind of spreads that tension so you're not getting posts to lean because they're thinking at corners, at gates, there's a lot of tension pulling on these posts and if you don't have it cross braced, it's gonna pull from the top and it's gonna end up angling it down versus having that dispersed uh, energy you know when it when it's pulling on it so that's my next step and that's going to be something where you support with rebars you just put a post across the two uh the the end post and the uh where you have your gates um okay so then you have that then the next step and this is again i'm telling you how to build a wire ranch style fence there are picket fences uh, chain link fences other types of wire um I'm sure it follows a similar formula, but this is how I'm doing my ranch fence. So I know I have to always qualify because online, especially when you talk anything related to dogs, do it yourself, things that require experience or research, people always have their own opinion or they think like, well, who are you to tell me how to do this? It's not that. I'm just sharing my experience. Maybe I have a little bit more than others. I've made a lot of mistakes and I've done a lot of research and that's what I'm kind of regurgitating to you. Um, so let's see, so then we're doing the wire fence. So then what we have in there on their way is we have the rolls of fence wire. And what you do, and this is something I'm still researching and learning more about, but you connect it on a corner and then you have to stretch it. Now the best way it seems to stretch it is if you have a farm implement like a tractor, or I think even an ATV you could do it. Um, I'm gonna see if I don't have access to one of those by then. Uh, there's a way that someone told me you could really with a couple strong people pull with rebar weave through the end of the fence, you know, and then you kind of pull it. And then what you do is you splice it because they come in hundred foot rolls. So we're going to do a six foot high by hundred foot roll, connect them at each point where we can get them to meet at a pole. And you just work your way around, you know, short of the gates, which is another, the next step after that, where I'm going to do some gate building, um, which I have very little experience in. So I'll maybe talk about that when I get around to it. Um, 
but you just work your way around, you know? And then for me, now here's where the dog thing comes in. And you wanna always think like an animal. Even when I built my chicken coop, I'm thinking like, how would an animal be escaping or trying to enter to get to my chickens in there? So how would a dog try to escape, right? And you wanna, I'm gonna have dogs all the way from my little Yorkie mini, who's a little four or five pound dog, to Bowie, who's a 120 pound dog who come barreling in like a, like a bull at one of the fence, you know, fence sections. So you wanna make sure it can support all that. You get dogs that dig. You can get dogs that could scale a six foot fence, you know, very rare. That's why we're going up to six feet, the highest you can do without having to get a special permit. Um, but you even have to watch for that. If your dog's a jumper, you may have to put some uh, fence rollers or something that angles over the top so it, or, or an electrified part on the top so it discourages your dog. Or if you have predators that can get into a six-foot fence, you have to regard that as well. Um, a big one for most dogs, though, is digging under or finding weak points or being able to pull at the wire. So what I'm going to do, and this is going to be a whole other chore, and I'm probably actually going to do it before I put the wire in, um, or around that time is I'm going to do a chicken wire and or a uh, some kind of rock log or brick. I have a lot of logs around the property and maybe just bury, you know, just something that's just going to be make it dig proof so that it discourages that ability to get under the fence. Uh, this is also something if you have a varied terrain when you're building a fence, you'll end up, uh, you know, having to do things to reinforce the bottom. If it's a, if it's, let's say, dogs you're trying to keep contained in it. Uh, so that's going to be a whole nother thing where I'm going to have to just get creative. Um, you can tell what parts I have planned and are already in progress or have been done already and what I'm step by stepping. I think for me, for my own anxiety as me being who I am, it's better to just stay with one. But I like to kind of talk about what the next step is. And then when I get to it, I, I immerse myself more into it. So that's a biggie for dogs. You want to make sure you have security on the uh, to make it dig proof. You want to find any loose areas because dogs like to find that. Another thing that I find, there was a... At West Hollywood Dog Park, I noticed this, and they've remedied this. And it was the first thing I noticed when they built this beautiful, new, lit-up turf park was that in the back section, there was like a hill. And then what it did was made the fence that I think was maybe five feet tall, now to like three and a half feet. And I'm like, oh, a dog's going to zero right in on that and just take a leap of faith if they really want to, you know, make, make a great escape here. So you have to look for high points because us, we have a six-foot fence. But then there'll be parts where maybe there'll be a boulder or a hill that makes that maybe a, like a three and a half foot, right? Uh, even though you're six feet, it's three and a half feet from the dog's vantage point. So you'll have to accommodate that. I may even have to, when I get into seeing the fence fully fully uh, put together, I may have to put on some reinforcement to get a little bit of a higher coverage, you know, for areas where a dog um, can... Uh, you know, kind of see that. Not really my dogs, but I'm having other people's dogs stay here. That's what this plan is to be able to do more boarding and board and train uh, here in Colorado. So, um, you know, again, that's the last thing you want when you have your dogs or anyone else's dogs on your property is an, es an escape that could have been prevented. Um, so you want to think of that. You want to have locks on your gates. You don't want someone who can open it or a dog who's crafty or clever can flick the, the latch and get it open. You want to have really good sturdy lock hardware. You don't want to be cheap on that. You want it to be really none of that rattly stuff. You want it to have very little give. Dogs, I do this when I talk to people about crate training. Once there's give and your dog has the potential to be an escape artist or an anxiety case, they are just going to run with it. They don't care if they're self-harming. You want to make it solid so they don't feel there's these weak points that they can fixate on. And some dogs don't care. Most dogs don't care. But you'll have dogs that think the grass is greener and they'll, you know, with enough time on their hands on supervised, you could get some problems arising in that department. So think like your dog. Um, now, if you have a smaller run, I obviously can't put a roof over an acre of, of space, but like for my chicken coop, or if you have a space you know, on the side of your house, I know in California where I see clients, there's a lot of coyotes in the hills, right? A lot of hawks and owls at night, and people have small dogs, even cats, they'll make a roof enclosure, which is great, right? You wanna make this roof enclosure pretty sturdy as you would make your regular side enclosures because you can get animals like raccoons that have dexterity and they can pull, just like I was talking about dogs, they'll find a weak point and they'll be able to get in there and find it. So you have to think like these animals if you're trying to build a fence beyond just for decorative reasons and you want it to be for security to keep your animals safe or to keep them from getting out on their own. Um, and like I said before, sometimes people electrify fences. We may do it just to keep um, animals out of our property like bears and predators and whatnot because we're going to let our chickens free reign, uh, free range on this property that we're fencing in too. Um, so we're thinking about that too. Uh, for dogs, I recommend more of a, um, 
an underground type of fence, which people do as a backup where they'll just have a line, you know, with the uh, transmitter receiver collar uh, and train their dogs just to respect the boundary without even worrying about the physical elements of what a fence will do. Um, so there's a lot of ways you can just reinforce an already well-built fence to make it that much more secure. Uh, and it really just depends in what area you live in, what the potential threats are, what your lifestyle looks like, what your dog's personal personality is like, their size, their you know willingness or ability to be an escape artist as well. Um, so yeah, I'm just rattling out some info. Um, as far as our fence, uh, you know, we're gonna finish it up and then what I'm gonna do, it's pretty cool, is in the back of the property, we have another area that has five foot posts in the ground already done. That was more just with uh, three um, rails on it, just for um, a corral where it's flattened out for horses riding. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna fence it and then I'm gonna create, because there's like a corridor, I'd say maybe about 50, 60 feet, maybe a little more between the main fenced area I've been talking about and this other area that I want to fence is my next project. And we're going to do like a gated system, like a dog park would have like a middle section. And this will just be like a long kind of like a, a, a corridor, you know, if you will, like a fence corridor that goes between the two so I can have dogs run through to the next one so they can explore more areas of the property and still be fenced in and safe. Uh, if I have dogs that I need to segregate or I want to work with a dog in one area and have other dogs fenced in safely in the other, um, it's all good options. So I'm excited. I hope you can hear the enthusiasm. I, as I am very upfront about, I am unable to see my clients in the real world other than now when I do boarding and boarding and train, which I'm starting to get here in Colorado uh, because I would fly into California a couple times a month and see my clients um, who I've been dedicated to, but unfortunately because of both travel and California being a, a lot more restricted, um, I've had to evolve. So um, that's again why I keep encouraging people. And my last podcast was all about uh, the online training. It's really been working out great. It's been identical to most type of sessions I would do in the real world. Uh, people are telling me it's helping them. I'm doing them at a discounted rate and I feel I'm giving, you know, I have more time on my hands. So, you know, I'm available so I, I can book more conveniently and it's all, you know, it's been great. And you know, you're supporting me. I'm able to help you still. This is keeping me alive and uh, sane because I do, although I like talking fence and this is related to dogs. That's why I thought it was cool to do a podcast about this. Um, I like being in front of dogs and owners and handling dogs and talking dog and teaching dogs. So the more that, you know, I'm supported throughout what's going on, who knows how long it's going to last, I can continue doing what I do. Um, so that's that. And I appreciate everyone who has been working with me. It's really been a, it's a vote of confidence. I had a guy recently who's been kind of tossing it up in the air. He's getting a new puppy. He's been, he listens to the podcast. You're probably listening to this one. And, um, you know, I, I, it was, you know, being forthcoming and I really love that when people don't, you know, cause I can pick up when people are like not telling me what they're thinking and I can tell. And he said, look, I get it. I think you're the guy, but it's, I'm a little hesitant having someone not in my home with my dog doing the training. And, um, you know, I explained how the merit and how this can still help. And he gave me the vote of confidence. And I really, I appreciate that probably more, although I'm, you know, I'm making less money and I'm not as busy than the people who wanted to just seek me out because I was too popular. I was always overbooked and it was almost like more than just my skills and ability. I think it was like a thing where they wanted me to just be like, to tell people I had like the, the busiest dog trainer or the dog trainer had that show on Facebook and that kind of stuff, um, which is great. Look, it keeps me busy and I'm not complaining, but you know, I like when people like kind of see what I'm trying to do more for like me and maybe the situation I'm in and just really kind of like, again, give me the vote of confidence. So thank you for all you online clients I've been working with the past couple months. I'm, I'm very grateful for that. Uh, let's see. Okay, so we'll wrap it up here. Um, again, don't forget to rate, review. We're kind of stagnant here at 17 reviews on the podcast. And uh, I get these weird analytics. And I don't know if anyone listening to this understands podcasts and can uh, help me understand how I can know how many people are listening to this and how I can get more people other than me asking to share and tell people and do the ratings and re share subscribing and all that. Um, but the more that, you know, anyone that can help with that, the better. I have more time so I can put more podcasts out. Um, although I promised you I'm still getting t around to it. We're working on having a little studio so more of the podcasts will be, uh, they'll have a video component to it. Um, and also working on an online course. So I'll have a 
full A to Z online course that covers everything that I teach, I mean, imaginable uh, to my clients over the years, all packaged in a nice organized way. Uh, so that's gonna come out hopefully within a couple months. We're really working hard at getting that done too. Um, okay, so thanks for listening. This has been How to Build a Fence or Kennel or Dog Run for Your Pet. And um, send me, if you get into these projects, send me some pictures. I'd love to see how maybe I motivated you to get in there and get dirty as well. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day.